All right, everyone, what's happening? Fleet of Fit as from Holistic Songwriting. Hope you're having a beautiful time. And welcome to this live QA where you get to ask your questions and I get to answer them. Live. All right, so what's been happening with Holistic Songwriting? While we wait to f while we wait until the chat fills up, let me tell you quickly what's been happening. I just recorded another podcast, so to say, for the album series together with Clifford from the Pop Song Professor which turned out really nice, I think. Uh, this time we're talking about Eminem's new album. And uh, yeah, I, it turned out pretty well, actually. I think it's a really interesting album and I'm a big Eminem fan. So this one was a pleasure to do. And as always, Clifford is just a really fun guy to talk to. And I think we um, figured out some nice things about Revival. So that's been happening. I've been working some more on the board game, which is coming along quite nicely. Uh, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Addiction Factory, which is my songwriting-based board game. And uh, tomorrow I'm building my second, or well, it's actually my third prototype already. And uh, I'm really excited for it. I think this is this is definitely a long ways, uh, a big improvement over the first couple of iterations of the game. And uh, it, I think it actually makes sense this time. So I think, uh, well, well, we'll see how it goes tomorrow. I'm going to do some playtesting uh, over the week and we'll see how everything goes. As for the book, uh, nothing much has happened because I'm working on a couple of new things. First of all, um, the, what, what did I say? The So To Say podcast? Well, because the, uh, the album series with Clifford is going to be video from now on. So it's not no longer just audio. There's going to be some vi visual elements. So I worked on like the the pre-rolls for that and like the bumpers and uh, I'm also working on a completely new show so uh, that's also quite exciting and uh, yeah good all right I think we have some people in the chat so let's head over there and see what people have been saying all right cool so Eminem time yes with a lot of exclamation marks says white boy Nick okay so guys do you have any questions to me about songwriting or anything songwriting related. Kyla says, can't wait for this board game. Settlers of Catan is going to wonder where everybody disappeared to. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to uh, edge on Settlers of Catan, though. Uh, all right. Uh, Max Martin songwriting breakdowns would be very interesting, as well as Ryan Tedder, because he has lots of credits. The problem, and see, a lot of people have been asking about Max Martin, and obviously I'm a big fan. It's really hard to do a breakdown of Max Martin in particular, because he's not the artist. Like... It's really hard to draw the line between what his influence is on the music and where the artist's influence comes from, right? I mean, he's first of all, it's not just one guy; it's an entire it's an entire factory, right? It's a hit, it's a hit song factory, and it's a lot of people working together to create what we know as Max Martin's music. It's not just one guy; he's a he's a company, right? It's a it's a trademark name, basically. So, um, so that's it's really hard to like pin it down and say like this is Max Martin's doing as it is with the artist series, of course, as well. But there it's a little bit easier because we can look at several albums of the same artist. And so we can kind of see, like, even though the producers changed, what has stayed the same? And that kind of leads me on, leads me to believe that there are certain um, consistencies in, in terms of what the artist is doing, right? And so I'm my guess is that that's probably the artist's intake on the whole thing. With Max Martin, it's really hard to say because... It's changing all the time. He gets new people into the team. And, you know, there's all this talk about melody math and all that kind of thing. Uh, I read a couple of interviews with him where he talked about it. And um, it's really nothing that I haven't really talked about on, on the channel and on my courses. It's all stuff that is kind of like that you can hear in his songs, right? And so I'd rather just listen to the artists instead of the producer, if that makes any sense. So that's kind of my reasoning behind that. But uh, maybe sometimes in the future, sometime in the future, maybe I I change my mind and I figure out a way where how I could do this. Uh, for now, not really. Okay. He's going to talk about me one day. Watch, says Roberto Cisneros. That's cool. Um, play, Please play some sounds on the synthesizer. So this right over here, I don't know if you guys can see this really well. This is a MOOC Voyager. And uh, from 2002, a mini MOOC Voyager, I should say. And it's a really, it's a really fun little uh, synthesizer. Let me turn up the speakers here a little bit so you can hear through the microphone. I'll turn this around. This is a super fun little thing.
right, so that's just a little bit of a demo. Obviously, I could be sitting here for hours playing with this thing, which I am already doing when you're not watching, so I might as well um, do that some other time. But that gives you a little bit of an idea what this thing sounds like. It's super fun to play with it. Um, again, Saren Kuruvila, hey, would you ever do a breakdown of Max Martin melodic, melodic math? Again, it's really hard to, to do that because there's not a lot that's known about it. There's a couple of things that he's shared in interviews that are all really interesting, but also kind of obvious when you listen to his songs. So I don't know. It's hard to say. Maybe someday, but it's, yeah. I, I see a lot of YouTubers doing that kind of stuff, but I think it's mostly like clickbait kind of stuff. I, I don't know. It's really hard to say what exactly me melodic math is because he doesn't really share a lot about it. I think it's just his term for like his rules about for songwriting, isn't it? All right. Um, let's see. What else do we get? Um, okay, so this is a good question. Really good question from uh, Fetty Music. He says, in your book, you talk about the energy curve and how it applies to many genres, with an exception of folk music. Can you elaborate on that? Is it because folk tends to keep the same energy level throughout? Um, there's, so the addiction formula is, was created to captivate an audience, right? It's about being really in your face and really like taking you by the hand and leading you through the song. Um, so in a way, it's a very like aggressive way of writing songs. And that's kind of what you hear on the charts is something that is really attention grabbing. Folk music, on the other hand, and also certain styles of electronic music, so sort of like spherical background music and that kind of thing, study music, that kind of music tends to be tends to have the, quite the opposite effect on people. And it's written for a different effect. It's it tends to. Uh, the, 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 for example, if you write study music, you don't want it to grab the attention of the listener. You want it to just like simmer in the background and uh, not to interfere with whatever the person is thinking, right? So that's why there's this, um, so that's why the addiction formula wouldn't really work for folk. However, if you want to make folk popular, so if you want to write folk music that is very poppy, that is, that is very attention grabbing, something like Ed Sheeran has done, for example, then the rules apply again. But if you want something that is very chill, very relaxed, kind of a Bon Iver kind of thing that is very much on the background and it's just beautiful to listen to and is and the, the calm of it is a big part of it, then I don't think it's maybe such a good idea. On the other hand, I have seen several tracks that were really laid back, that were really relaxing. And what they did is they just kind of stretched out the formula. So they just, instead of having like... Uh, four bars per section or eight bars or bars per section they might go to like 32 bars for a section and sort of dr uh, drew it out like that and so in order that to do that uh to to kind of stretch out the energy jumps and make them less jumpy if that makes any sense if you've read the book i think you'll know what i'm talking about here um cool the arrow 44 says just want to say i'm a huge fan listening to the addiction formula right now and taking notes awesome dude super super glad to hear that um cool is there any validity to songwriting contests, says Robert Maisner. Oh, man, I'm probably not the right person to talk to because um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to say. It really depends on the judges. It really depends on who judges you. Is it like the audience or is it professional judges? And if it's professional judges, do they listen to the same music as you do? Do they understand what you're trying to do? It, it's so hard to say, I think, you know. Um, there are some cases where it's kind of obvious and where the entire audience is going to know like, oh yeah, this is, this is the most professional. But I've been to, to contests of, you know, not even songwriting contests in this case, but stuff where, uh, for like um, talent shows or whatever. And it's not, it, it was rarely the best person, the best act that won. It was usually the one that was just the most charming. And typically those were the ones that, it was like people that had their first ever appearance on stage. And so the audience was rooting for them. And so if you're really looking at songwriting contests in terms of like validation that you're a good good writer, I don't think necessarily that there um, there is any validity to them. But um, that's just my personal experience with them. Um, yeah, I don't know. Cool. Blue and Me says, hello there. Well, hello back at ya, Blue and Me. Welcome back. Um, Ryan Tedder is an artist, though, unlike Max Martin, so he would be really interesting to hear you talk about, maybe about his band One Republic, says Mr. Burning Volcano. Yeah, Ryan Tedder came up a lot when people commented on the videos 
Um, I don't know, maybe if One Republic releases their next album, we'll do an album series on them. But for now, like the next series, the next season of the artist series is going to be more alternative indie kind of. So, uh, well, actually One Republic might fit into that. So we'll see. Cool. What else? Oh, um, okay. Enjoying your ear training course, hoping it will help me, says Happy Ron. Well, I hope that too. Um... Cool. Uh, Ignas Saunoria says, is that how you pronounce it? I have no idea. Currently, I'm reading your book, and I was thinking, could the chorus part be less in hype than the verses, but still have the feeling of tension released to which listeners look forward to? Please, examples. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's kind of actually a trend of having like these really low hype choruses. And, you know, Taylor Swift's uh, Look What You Made Me Do was an example. And, uh, oh, Jesus, there's... Um, What's that song by Usher? Uh, going nowhere fast, we've reached the climax. That's what it's called, climax, which is like sort of building, building, building. And then the chorus is just this really small kind of really very, very pretty uh, chorus. It's one of the best Usher songs out there, isn't it? I love that song so much. Um, such a great lyric and really great production. Great performance. Really love that song. So it is possible. Um, it's just, I think... The, the labels of saying this is a chorus, this is a verse, you can take those labels off and just say like, hey, let's just make music and follow the addiction formula in terms of like, so in the addiction formula, I first lay out kind of the rules if you want to create your own structures. And um, right, so like with the one, two, three rule and all that kind of stuff, you can just take that and pretend there's no such thing as a chorus and a verse and just write music that follows those kind of guidelines. And... Um, that's kind of what those songs are doing, I think. So the label of saying this is a chorus becomes kind of um, blurred. It's really hard to say, is this a verse or is this a chorus? Or is this, what is this? this is after the chorus, but it kind of sounds like a chorus. So is this a, some people call it post-chorus, but it's kind of ridiculous because it's, it's just music. It sounds like another chorus, right? Um, so let's just forget about the labels and just kind of figure out like what works and what doesn't. And that's kind of what I was trying to do with the addiction formula in the first uh, big section of it. I'm trying to teach you the, the rules of making up those energy curves that will work regardless of whether, you know, you do that with a chorus or with a verse. So um, another example might be, um, is that Toxicity or is it Chop Suey or is it maybe both songs? I think it might actually be both. I think it's Chop Suey for sure by System of Down has like these really, really big, heavy kind of verses. And then the chorus is really pretty harmonious and very low in hype. And um, so that also works really well because it's still following those same kind of formulas of where you have like a lot of dynamics and between the different sections, there's very clear, a very clear distinction. So that still works, you know. So I guess that's kind of how it works. Cool. Uh, Steve P says, can I some... Can I get some of your background? Are you a singer, songwriter, or a musician who writes music? I am a songwriter slash producer. So uh, I also sing a little bit, but not very well, as you may have heard just now. Um, I also play guitar, and that's kind of what I studied. I, for two years, I studied jazz guitar, um, but I didn't really like it, so I quit doing that and went to study um, media music, which was more about production. And so I spent a lot of time also composing classical music for movies, and I still do that. Like all of the music that you hear for holistic songwriting was written by me, except for one single piece that I wrote, and that's like the one, that's the video called what's what's this thing called holistic songwriting or whatever. It's like the the one video, like the opening video on on YouTube. But everything else is written by me, so that's all my work. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, Jeff Rona and, um, you know, I got the chance to get a really great re recommendation from Conrad Pope, who is John Williams' orchestrator. Um, so that's kind of my background. I did a lot of film stuff, a lot of TV, did some video game music, um, that kind of thing for a long time. Um, but I've always played in bands. I, um, I've been playing in cover bands for the last year and uh, just now quit, so I can only focus on holistic songwriting. Yeah, so that's kind of my background at the moment. Hey, oh, that's a good question. Uh, Anderson Four says, any tips for electronic pop writing so that it works well live? That's a really good question um, because it's always difficult if you have, so, so with modern production, we get the opportunity to produce, to overproduce our tracks, right? We have the opportunity to 
the chance to to write 50 different tracks or 300 tracks like one of my latest sessions is over 300 tracks and um so we do but when we try to transport that to a live setting that can get really tricky obviously because we don't have 300 instruments on stage so what it comes down to is you really kind of need to rearrange everything or you play with a backing track and um i've done both so I've also done a mix of two of the two. So we had some instruments were live, some came off the record. And uh, I didn't really love that one just as a, in terms of like how it felt on stage. And also it didn't really sound that great. I, th I feel like we would have had to put a lot more time into it to make it really sound like anything. Um, so what I what I found is probably best is if you have the time, it's really best to rearrange the tracks. And especially if you're writing something that is really a live kind of uh so so we were a rock band right for us it didn't really work to have like this electronic synthesizer coming off the tape it really made more sense for us to just play live and forget about the synthesizers that are on the album so that worked better for us if in a pop setting i think uh having everything come off the tape um or rewriting everything for a live band is probably the best way to go um, it also creates a sort of different atmosphere. It just really depends on where you're playing as well. You know, if you're playing in a huge, huge stadium, obviously you want a band there uh, because it's just going to look, it's going to fill up the stage a little bit better, right? Or you're going to have a lot of dancers at least to do that. Um, but if you're playing a really small club, then it's probably better to have just one or two musicians and kind of rearrange it for, for just one or two instruments. If you have like a medium-sized club, then it's you can go either way. You know, it's really depends on what you're trying to do. But um, a lot of the times you will have to rearrange your tracks. And um, I actually like doing that because it gives me the opportunity to put in some stuff that's not on the EP to actually write another section that is just really that is just for for live gigs. A couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, I should say, I was at a revival concert, a reunion concert of a band that I played in while I was living in Freiburg. So that was must be seven years ago now. It was a ten year revival kind of concert, and um, they were really great live, but. What they did is like every single song they had at least one kind of communication interaction with the audience thing built into the song so it wasn't just like that they were stopping the song and then they did some interaction no it was like all baked into the songs and that kind of stuff i'm really really into because when i'm when i go to a concert i want to be involved i don't want to just feel like i'm sitting at home listening to a record i want to get the feeling like hey this is real this is live they're speaking to me right now this is happening only once and it's happening nowhere else but here so if you get, if you can sort of um, meet someone where they're at at that very moment, I think it's really powerful. And if you get them to move a little bit and maybe move, get them to move to the music or shout or sing along to your songs, I think that is very, very powerful on a psychological level, not just on a um, let's make sure everyone has a good time kind of level. All right. Um, hmm. Ali Genius 5 says, what is a really successful recent song that doesn't follow most conventional rules? The first th song that I just that just popped up into my head was um, "Big Bottom" by um, No Wait. It's not Big Bottom. That's the Spinal Tap song. What's it called? The the one by um, J Lo and uh, Iggy Iggy Azalea. Azalea. Uh, Azalea. That's what what she's called. Um, what's what's that called? Jesus, guys, help me out here. Uh, so that that will be one in any case. That is um, that is one. I think um, Justin Timberlake's new song "Filthy" is kind of interesting. It's kind of a cool song uh, in terms of the production. It's really strange. It's kind of like a modern, really dark electro funk, and uh, it takes some time to get used to. Uh, so what's weird about that? I think. So first of all, what's weird about the um, Jennifer Lopez song is. Um, Big Booty, that's what it's called, right? Or is it just called Booty? Something like that. Anyways, um, what's weird about that song is I call, that's what I call a genre song. It's a song that is like so bare bones. There's n almost nothing to that song. There's almost no harmony. It's really all about that groove and about the idea. And so it's just going to appeal to a very specific minority of people. But it's going to appeal to those people like on a like big time, right? And um, it's just not, it's, it's a song that's not written for everyone. If it were, there was a lot. There would be a lot more harmony. Same thing with um, "Girls We Run the World" by um, "Girls Run the World" by Beyonce, right? It's just super. It's just super rhythmical. There's almost nothing else to that song. And to a certain degree, although they went a little bit further with it and it's a little bit more mainstream, was that uh, what was that again? It was Nicki Minaj with um, 
Um, uh, boom, boom, bang, bang, bang. Is that what it's called? Bang, bang, into the room. You know I want it. That song? It's called Bang, Bang, I think. Um, those kind of songs, for to me, are like almost niche songs. They're really like all about the groove. Um, and then the new Justin Timberlake song, I think, is really interesting because it's just the... The instrumentation of it is really strange, like that synthesizer that's just going like the wah, 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 that kind of thing, which so almost sounds like dubstep, but then used in such a different way for like a funk song, it's really strange, but kind of interesting. And also it's the way it's, it's de it deals with, with harmony, I think is really interesting. It's really a sound design kind of thing. So those, that type of song I find really interesting when when a song manages to deal without harmony. It's not like this is a new phenomenon either. Like there's plenty of older songs that have just one chord, like Pink's Let's Get This Party Started was only only just one chord, you know? Um, or Blurred Lines to a certain degree also is pretty much just one chord. So it, with those songs, it really becomes a about the groove and about the, about the sound design. And those kind of songs I find really interesting from a songwriting standpoint, because they're really going against what is commonly accepted as good practice. All right. Blue and Me says, how would you start to create a marketing concept like the ones you analyze in your artist series? Well, that's something that really the, the next book is going to be about. So um, I think what it really starts with is figuring out where you're at in the sort of um, in your career and what the next step should be. And uh, for I think for a lot of musicians, the next step should really be just just like sit down and analyze what they're actually doing and whether that's working or if it's not and um it really is so the first thing is kind of just like to streamline a little bit what you're doing if you if you look at your last five things that you've released whether that be videos or social media posts or songs um especially look at those big things that you release not so you know social media posts also play a part but mostly like songs and actual artistic stuff that you've released productions um and really look at how they're similar and how they're different and if they're too different you may want to think about like maybe streamlining that a little bit for the next uh song that you release and kind of thinking about like which of those things that i released do i like best what i th what do i think is like the coolest thing what fits my voice my character my instrument the best what just sounds and works the best what have i gotten the best feedback for you know so it's not like you can just plan all of this before you actually release anything. I think it's important that you just start working on something because, you know, throughout the writing process, you, whatever comes out is going to change anyways. Um, so, yeah, I guess that will be my, my answer about that. So just experiment with that and um, see if you uh, find anything that just feels good. In the beginning, I think it should be all about that. And once you have that, then um, I think the book's going to be the next step. All right. Uh, Logbia 7K says, if I want to create a good sounding harmony, what spectrum of the piano should I play keys on simultaneously? So there's this thing that you kind of start your chords around middle C. So if this was middle C here, and it's not, let me just turn on the volume here. If this was middle C right here, then you kind of want to start. You kind of want to uh, start your chord around here, and you can go a little bit lower as well. So, like, I don't know, maybe to uh, G below middle C's. Like, that's that's a pretty good range. So those two octaves here, maybe one and a half octaves, maybe two from uh, G below middle C to uh, C above middle C. That's a pretty good range for chords. And then an octave below, you kind of want to play your octaves in for the bass. That's kind of like what's accepted amongst arrangers um and let me think about what's what that actually how it actually works in pop music well in pop music you don't really have that many chords anymore do you there's a lot of just bass notes there's a lot of just like it's just a hook so the bass note is just the hook and there is no real real chord right harmony really only becomes important anymore with maybe backing vocals or sometimes if you have like um guitar lick or something that plays plays the chord kind of like that um but that's like how it works for 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 standard arrangement. That's kind of like the register that you want to keep your chords in, I guess. Oh, good, good, uh, good point here. Bill Me says, I find it really hard to combine theoretical songwriting knowledge as you teach in the addiction formula with my intuitive, really emotional way of songwriting. Well, 
to me, the addiction formula just kind of provides the bare bones to a song. And then I put a lot of emotion into the song. Once once I have the bare bones, I know it's I know this is how the song has got to look somehow, right? I know kind of this is the formula. And so I write, write, write and see what follows the formula. And then I sort of like chisel off the stuff that really doesn't work. Um, so there's certainly times when I'm writing, where I'm just writing emotionally. I'm not really not thinking about anything. I'm just feeling out what feels right. And eventually, like for the very final product, emotion is still my number one decision maker, right? If I'm not feeling it, it's got to go. Uh, and there's no addiction formula that's going to help me with, with that. So it is all about emotion still. Uh, but it still helps me to have the addiction formula to kind of like, especially with the production, I find it really, really uh, useful. And with the arrangement of it all, I find it really useful to have certain guides that uh, I can follow for that. Uh, HK says, have you ever had a song that turned out far better than you thought? I mean, you don't fully know till you apply yourself fully through the recording process, even when it is tiring. Thanks. Let me think about that. Thing is, I rarely write on songs anymore that I'm not feeling straight away. I, you know, in board gaming, they do something called rapid prototyping, which means you do a proof of concept as soon as possible. Like you have the idea and you immediately start um, designing a prototype so you can test out if it's even fun. And I kind of do the same thing with music as well. When I have an idea that I like, I'll produce something really quickly, 30 second demo of just that portion that I have, that I had the idea for. And if it touches me, then I'll keep going with it. That just naturally happens. But if nothing's happening, if, if, it, if it doesn't do anything for me, I won't. But uh, so that's kind of my process since, um, I don't know, for the last five to six years, I guess. But let me think about how that went before that. I think there were moments when I had like, so that still kind of happens to me. So this might be an example for that. I might have a song where I have a really great verse. I love the verse of it. And then I'm like, okay, now we got it. We need a really amazing chorus. And I can't think of anything. And it has happened that um, I had to really push through until I got that really great chorus, until I really figured out something um, that will work for the chorus. And most of the time it meant also rewriting or rearranging rather the verse before it. But um, it has sometimes paid off. Yes. Sometimes working through difficult times, working through your writer's block, and especially by changing the status quo, doing something new with what you already have to give yourself new ideas has sometimes worked. Uh, what I've found what never works, or at least it's never worked for me is if I have written a verse and I've written a chorus, and I now need to like, so I've written a, the entire arrangement, I've written the entire music, now I re need to write a melody uh, on top of that. And I can't think of anything right there almost on the spot. Like if I can't think of anything in the, in the first 10 minutes or so, then it's probably not a really interesting musical backing track, and I'm going to rewrite it. So for me, music needs to be inspiring, in other words. Um, if the music doesn't inspire me to write a great melody to it, then the music, there's something wrong with the music. And that's something um, I work on quite a lot. On uh, For me, a good backing track just has to be inspiring. That's all it's got to be. If I'm listening to it, I'm like, oh, wow, this is cool. Rhythmically, I, I want to sing across that. I want to, that's, that's really what it feels like to me. It's just singing through, kind of going through the gaps, filling the holes with, with a melody kind of. Um, so a backing track really has to be inspiring for me. And in those cases, if it's not, then I'm going to rewrite the backing track and try to start it, try to look at it from a completely new angle. All right. Uh, cool. Arik, Arik Devine says, this channel's methods have helped me get over 1 million total stream, streams and views. That's so awesome, dude. Really glad to hear that. Um, cool. Can we listen to your stuff somewhere? It would be cool if you left us like a link or something. Um, Steve P says, Gabriel, that's why we have the internet. You can reach an audience anywhere in the world. What did Gabriel say? Is it possible to have an audience, people who enjoy your work when you're a foreigner artist and can't actually be able to perform live periodically? For example, any tips for that? Yeah, kind of what Steve said. Um, the internet is the best place for that. And um, even just going on a live stream like this and performing, uh, having like a sort of living room concert for your fans is a great thing. And you can do that through almost any social media platform at this time. So that's something to really take advantage of, I think. So um, yeah, go try that out. I think the internet really is super, super powerful when it comes to that. 
And even if you if you don't want to perform, um, I, for example, myself, I'm really thinking about making an EP this year. Um, I don't really think I'm going to be touring too much because that's not really what I'm interested in. I, I'm really going to focus on uh, producing music and music videos for that. But that's about it. I don't really want to tour. It's just not my thing. Other people's other people really might love that. I don't know. It was just never really my thing. Um, if I have a really good idea for a show, then I definitely want to try that out. If it's something really new, something groundbreaking, but if I feel like I'm not really adding anything to the picture, I don't know. It's just not something that really interests, interests me. But um, again, if, even if I just write songs and produce music videos, the internet is a really great place for that. I mean, it can be. It's obviously, there's a lot of stuff on it, so it, it, the tricky part, become, tricky part becomes breaking through the ice um, of you know, all that stuff that is bombarding uh, people's attention already. Cool. Eric Devine says, of course my platform is YouTube, brother. My name is Eric Devine. I owe this channel big time. Well, super glad to hear that, man. That makes me really happy. Um, Steve P says, yes, make the EP. Yeah, I'm definitely... Uh, I definitely want to do that. It's just a time thing. Holistic songwriting has really taken out, up a lot of time, but I really, really want to start. And now that I got this cool thing, and you know, it's really something I want to work on. Also, I have some, I think, really interesting ideas for uh, an EP. Also, I want to do like a breakdown of the sessions and maybe record my writing process to kind of use that as an educational tool for you guys, sort of as an excuse for, for writing an EP when I should be really making a course for <laughs> holistic songwriting. So, yeah. Good question. Alexander Schmiedel, which I'm thinking is a German name, which rhymes with something very naughty in German. How do you connect into the music scene? I'm sorry, Alexander, I'm sure you've heard, you hear that every day. How, you, how do you connect into the music scene for movie and video game music? Is it about direct contexts, context, contrasts, or more like keeping it online and waiting? So this is a huge subject, right? And I spend uh, five years yeah, five years of my life just trying to wrap my head around how film music and game music works. And they're really two different things, completely different things. It's really diff different to write for a film than it is to write for a video game. So let's talk about film really quickly. I, I wrote uh, my bachelor thesis on tempo in film, which is a really, really interesting subject. And when I went to LA, to uh, where I lived for three months and worked with Jeff Rona, who wrote the music for... You know, he did all the ethnic bits in The Gladiator, for example. So he's um, he's worked with Hans Zimmer and all these people. And um, he's a really interesting guy. And the first thing he always does, which was particularly interesting to me because I had just written my bachelor thesis on tempo, was he just finds the tempo. And um, also when I went to a master class by Conrad Pope, uh, he clapped through, the, clapped through the cuts to figure out what the tempo for the scene should be. So... Um, as a first start into film music, if you're interested in writing for film music, really pay attention to tempo. And uh, what Conrad did is he would turn down the volume of the, of, the, of the film completely, and then he would just cut through the claps, meaning he would try to find a tempo that would kind of hit all the different cuts in the film. And that would kind of tell him, okay, so that's kind of the tempo that the music should follow. And very rarely will the music hit every single cut. That's not necessarily something that's always good and if you have a very slow scene something very relaxing you definitely don't want to do that and you kind of want to uh, find your way through it but still you can take the claps the, the 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 cuts as a sort of guideline how fast the music should go but you kind of don't want to hit those claps in action scenes especially if you look at action movies during the first quarter um hour of the of every action movie just listen to the music and how much of the action it hits Typically, it's going to hit a lot of the cuts and it's going to hit a lot of the, if there's a car chase, it's going to hit the explosions, it's going to hit the crashes, it's going to hit all of that. And uh, that's kind of good action writing, what's called Mickey Mousing, because it's closely following what's on screen. And if you listen to those old uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons where you have like xylophones of someone's walking upstairs, doo -doo 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 -ding, that kind of thing, where it closely mimics what's happening on screen. We still do that today. It's still called Mickey Mousing, but it's maybe something a little bit it doesn't sound as fun, you know? It's like um, you might have like a drum kind of drum roll or something like that before, and then the music stops when the car is in the air, 
and then and then we go back into the music kind of like dun, 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 that kind of thing um yeah, so as a very first kind of guideline, if you're interested in writing for film, the first thing you really need to be looking at is tempo and figuring out the right tempo for the scene. I, fu I found that once I did that for my own scores, it really improved my scores by a hundredfold, really. It really, really changed the way I write for music, for films. Okay, would you consider hosting a songwriting competition, says the Aero, the, the Aero 44? Um, Maybe. How would that look? What would, would, would you guys think? How should that look? Is that something that you guys would judge? Is that like an audience thing? Or is it something that I would judge? Or do we have two separate prizes? What do you guys think? What should be the prize for it? Because I don't know. Let's just brainstorm. What do you guys think? How would this uh, whole thing look? Um, Nizar Alzain says, how, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all of these names. How can a song have just one chord? Can you elaborate? Well, there's certain songs that don't really need that many chords if something else is in the foreground. So if we go back to uh, Get This Party Started by Pink, or um, as I said, to a certain degree, Blurred Lines, um, or I mean, there's several funk songs or a lot of funk songs actually that do that. And usually the, the common thread is the rhythm becomes more important. If the rhythm is just really catchy, if it's really like, kind of has this addictive quality to it where you just really want to start to dance. If that works works really, really well, then you almost don't need any harmony. Filthy, I think, by Justin Timberlake also almost hasn't, any, hasn't got any harmony. Um, then again, Filthy has some moments where there's like some really colorful chords that sort of give a lot of contrast to that otherwise very sort of bland and very dark, monotonous kind of sound. So that's done really well. Um, but that being said, there's plenty of songs that have just one chord and it still sounds cool because everything else works so well, right? The groove is just so catchy or um, maybe the production, the sound design is so amazing. Then it's, it doesn't have to be about the, about the harmony, right? A lot of people focus on harmony, especially songwriters. They think that's harmony's everything. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes a song can be just really one chord um, or maybe one riff, you know, you, if you just have a really good riff on your guitar, sometimes that's all you really need. Blue and Me says, a question you probably got a million times, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, how do you write your songs? Do you have an idea and then start working it out? Or is there a melody first or words or a beat? Um, it really differs from project to project. And... Um, Currently my, currently, my current way of writing music is, and this is mostly instrumental music, um, I used to do it by starting with the chords. Right now, I'm really often starting with beats. Um, that's something I found works really well. And um, I'm even going back to working with loops again and uh, using them as a basis to sort of get some emotion there like early on and then sort of working with that and messing with that um, harmonically to sort of turn it into something uh, new and different. So beats is kind of like how I start my new uh, kind of productions. And if I'm writing something R&B heavy, yeah, the beat is definitely going to be one of the earliest things I'm going to write. Um, if I write pop songs, typically it's either the beat or more prominently probably the vocals. So I'm going to have like one melody that I really like. It's just going to be like one short fragment of maybe 10 seconds if I'm lucky. And that's probably usually going to be my chorus. And then I go from there. Um, I've also written from lyrics, although very rarely. Um, I've written from, as I said, chords. I've written from just the guitar. Sometimes I just play around until I hit, get, get like a really interesting riff or something like that. Um, especially when I wrote metal music and rock music, I would often start out on guitar and just find a riff that sounded good. Just whatever gets me inspired. You know, that's really what it's about. I said this earlier about the, the backing tracks. If the backing track isn't inspiring, uh, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And that's how it really is for me. I'm just I'm just going to do something until I hit something where I'm like, oh, this is inspiring. I want to write to that. That just sounds so good. I want to hear that over and over again. And just I can't wait to like write more to that. Um, I, I have just one song that I'm, oh, man, I really would like to show it, but I can't, unfortunately. But it's um, because it's it's not been released yet. But it's such a cool song that I wrote for another artist. And I just it's one of those songs it's, at the moment. It's just 45 seconds. But it's just something I just keep playing over and over again. I get really excited about it. And even while it's playing, I'm just already like thinking of new stuff. I'm like, oh, I could do this here. And oh, I'm already singing over it and trying to figure out new melodies. 
uh, it's got to be inspiring. And what I'll hear a lot from songs that are sent in to me is, um, or when I when I go to like open mic nights or something like that, a lot of it really just for me, and it might be different for everyone. For me, it just isn't really that inspiring. I'm not like, oh, I want to write something to that. That really gets me excited. It does happen sometimes, um, maybe like one out of three times, but a lot of stuff that I hear just doesn't really inspire me. And um, it's for, for a lot of artists, I'm thinking like, oh, it's no wonder you didn't write something, a good melody to that, because just the basis of it is just not really interesting already. So um, yeah, inspiring is just my key word today. HK says, I know your addiction formula book may be in the past for you, but I constantly find it inspiring. Thanks. Well, super glad to hear that. Um, it's not so much in the past because I just did the audiobook and I rewrote it a little bit uh, for the second edition. Um, also, I'm working on a German version of it right now, and a Spanish version is also coming out soon. So it's not as much in the past as you might think. And I'm constantly thinking about like how to play with it, and I'm giving you know master classes on the book. So um, it's not as much in the past as you might think. I'm still constantly like trying to re rewrite the, the concept and try to like nail down, like just make it more precise and kind of figure out how it works. Hmm. B Beats says, hi, man, how are you? If you had a music project that you really believe in and someone offered you a decent amount of money, how would you invest that money? Publicity, knowledge, collaborations? Oh, that's a really good question. It's a little bit of everything probably, but the two things I find most important, the production needs to be amazing and the, the artwork, uh, the production, it's really about the, just the way the final product looks is the most important thing. Um, promotion sure is important, but the most important thing is that you have a great fucking product. If your product, like if you have, if you, put thousands of bucks into marketing and advertising or whatever, but your product doesn't look amazing, simply astounding, then, I mean, it's going to fall flat, you know? I mean, the only way to really get to people is if you have truly great content. If people look at your thumbnail on YouTube or something and say like, wow, this looks interesting, I'm going to check that out. Or if your title of your song is really interesting, or your the cover of your EP looks really great, or and then once they've clicked on your song, it better sound great, you know? So spending that money on production or if you want to produce it yourself on production gear um on good artwork uh on you know t you know improving yourself as an artist you know taking singing lessons stuff like that that i think is where all most of your money should go and once you got that once you have a team once you have all of that together then next the next thing probably would be the marketing and it's especially for testing so uh, seeing what works and what really doesn't work about what you're doing. Um, I'm always careful with that because it, it eventually it's really about what you think is good and you shouldn't just rely on what people tell you is good. If you don't like what people like, then you probably should still write the music that you like instead of writing what everyone else likes because eventually you're just it's just going to make you depressed if you never write the stuff that you really want to write. Is my you know thinking on it at least. I mean, if you're like the head of BMG, you're probably going to see that a little bit differently. But um, yeah, so in terms of like, what what does that mean? Uh, publicity or marketing? I, I would place a couple of ads on Facebook or YouTube or um, even Google somehow, maybe there might be a way to do that as well. Probably YouTube is your best bet or SoundCloud or Netflix. Uh, what's it called? Jesus, man, today. Netflix, is that even possible? Can you do Netflix ads? I don't even know. I haven't really seen any. But um, yeah, Spotify, that kind of thing. Um, and having a really good kind of trailer that is really short and to the point and conveys kind of what you're all about in those, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Um, then it makes sense to put a little bit of money into that and just see what works, you know. And it's, especially it's kind of for testing. When I say testing, what I mean really is you kind of want to figure out which one of your trailers works the best. So you definitely don't want to just make one trailer and and just see if it works or fails. You want to make three or four or five and try all of them. And if one works really well and the others don't, then just use that one and put more money into that. So in the beginning, um, for that kind of testing, you need a little bit more money, uh, maybe 20 bucks a day to 40 bucks a day, which sounds like a lot. And it is, <laughs> to be fair, it really is. But it really is going to help you to 
send your stuff, your trailers or whatever, your ads to a lot of different people. And then you, you really have the numbers to really be able to statistically tell which of those trailers, which of those ads work better than others. And then you can weed out the ones that don't really work. So in the beginning, um, yeah, it's not really something I want to talk about too much because I know most songwriters that hear this are going to think like, oh, now it's all about marketing and they're not going to think about their songs anymore. And the songs really are the most important thing. I want to come back to that. If your songs are shit, no marketing is ever going to help you. So really work on your songs and work on your productions. Make sure that the final product that you present to people, and that includes the music video, that includes the artwork, that includes your banner on Facebook, that includes everything. Make sure that that is absolutely top notch, right? That's the only way to ever really make, make it in this industry. Have something that is truly outstanding and um, the marketing pretty much will take care of itself. Again, those, having a little bit of extra push from ads in the beginning can be really helpful. Uh, it's something that I definitely did with the artist series as well. I, um, you know, I believed so much in the artist series. I knew that it was the best thing that I'd ever done with that first episode that I released. I was so, so proud of it that I put a lot of money into it, into the ads, because I knew that it was good. And I said to myself, if this fails, I have no clue about this whole business and I should keep myself out of it. And uh, I was, it was really a, a Either this works or I'm just I'm just quitting with holistic songwriting because if this doesn't work, really I don't have any clue about this business, then I've really misjudged everything. And uh, But for that, it was really important for me to really truly believe in my product. And I really believed in my artist series. I really knew that it was really great and I wouldn't have put so much money into it hadn't I really believed in myself and in the product. So really make sure that you have something great first because down the line, it's going to help you so, so much. Cool. All right. Um, totally Overrated asks if I ever used FL Studio. I'm really not a big fan. I gave some classes on it for uh, high school kids. And um, uh, like, because that was like mandatory from the school because they that's what that was the software that they use on campus. Um, and I'm not a big fan. I tried to get into it. It's it's it may be easy in the beginning, but I found like all the stuff that I want to do, like the more complicated stuff with automation and all that kind of thing, just is so much easier in other software. And yeah, the Ableton Live migration still isn't coming very well. I'm still still working in Logic just because it's quicker. And at the moment, time is so is so um, how do you say it? time is rare? I don't know what people say. There's some saying about that. Um, German and me coming out again. Sorry, guys. Um, what is my favorite genre of music, says Steve P. Um, ah, it's a different question, a difficult question, and it's going to be a different answer depending on what day it is. Um, I'm listening to a lot of folk music, so I guess that would probably be my answer. A lot of folk music. Also, like, electronic, relaxing kind of music. I like hip-hop mixed with jazz, that kind of thing. I, I really like, uh, like, electronic hip-hop with jazz influences. I like jazz a lot, um, but then only really like the the complicated kind of pleasing but complicated something like um, yeah I don't really want to say uh, because I'm doing a podcast on that very soon, but I, I like a certain certain kinds of jazz. I'm gonna do a I'm gonna do a podcast very soon about my top fifty influential artists. Um, that's coming out next week, I believe. Next Wednesday, is that right? Um, very soon, anyways. And it really talks about 50 artists, why I think they're influential, what they've taught me. And uh, from that, I think you're going to get a good idea of what kind of my favorite genres are. Uh, rock popped up a lot on that list, too. So I'm a big rock fan, and especially grunge and post-grunge and metal even in some points. So, yeah. I, I listen to a lot of different music. I also listen to classical music, you know, um, certain kinds of classical music. I'm not such a big fan of, um, you know, Mozart and Beethoven. Beethoven sometimes. Um, I'm more of a fan of uh, Debussy, Igor Stravinsky, um, Schubert, certain songs. Um, yeah, that's that's more my thing, I think. Um, a little bit more modern stuff. Um, not so much really like Vienna classic. Vien, Vienna School of Vienna. What is that called in English? I don't even know. Anyways, moving on. Uh, by the way, we have ten more minutes, so I'm th I'm just gonna answer one or one or two more questions. Riffman Joe says, "Can you recommend slash point us to more tutorials or courses for instrumental writing for movies? Some practical approach, as you just explained with the Mickey Mouse, would be great. Thanks." 
I try to find something like that. It's really, really hard. Uh, there's more on orchestration and classical composition. Uh, and there's a lot of books that I could recommend, like Samuel Adler is the first one that comes to mind. There's, um, oh Jesus, what was that called? There's a bunch of books that are just called orchestration. Um, I mean, the I think Samuel Adler's book is just called The Guide to Orchestration or something like that. There's my favorite orchestration book that I really could recommend was a French one from the 19th century. And it was also just called orchestration. Let me check out what that was called. Uh, orchestration book. I don't know. We'll figure it out if it's here somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah. Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov's Principles of Orchestration is also really good. Uh, Walter Piston's book on orchestration is very good. Uh, Cecil Forsyth, Forsyth, that's the one that I meant. Cecil Forsyth's orchestration, I find um, the best uh, orchestration book out there. I would just found it the most practical. I learned the most from that one, even though it's super old and there's some things that are really outdated, like um, like the you know the horns used to have like these different. Um, I don't even know what it's called anymore. They they didn't have like the valves, so they had to exchange stuff all the time and put different kind of tubes into whatever I don't even know anymore it's just it's outdated that part but it, there's a lot of good stuff in there as well it's for romantic kind of music and so that's what a lot of Hollywood music is so that part is really interesting um, then I also recommend Jeff's book uh, so as I said I uh, I worked with him for three months and I first heard about him through his book the real world and that's spelled r-e-e-l like film real so the real world is still a very is one of the best um, film music books I find. Talks a lot about a lot of different things, um, and then there's a couple of a bunch of online sources. I have like a I'm on a couple of newsletters um, that I don't read anymore because I don't do a lot of film music anymore. Um, what really helps is just studying, buying a lot of soundtracks to films, and really listening to, listening to what they sound like without the movie, and kind of figuring out how film music works on that level. And um, obviously watching a lot of movies is gonna help. Uh, and analyzing, really deeply analyzing movies is a, such a big part of it. Um, I learned so much more from, I, I for my, as, as I said, from a bachelor's th thesis on tempo and film music, I think I, we watched three movies, but really analyzed those really, really intensely. And I probably watched a scene like over a hundred times to like really understand how it works and how the tempo works with and what it does emotionally to the track. And that really helped me a lot. That's I learned so, so much from that. So pick a couple of your favorite film scores and really analyze them, see what they're doing and try to do something like that, I guess. Uh, HK says, do you use Logic's drummer? No, I don't. Are you into opera, says Blue and Me? I'm assuming you mean uh, music opera and not the browser. Uh, my mom dragged me to a lot of uh, operas when I was a kid. And there were some that I really liked and a lot that I just thought were kind of boring, to be honest. Um, but then again, I was a teenager and now I very rarely go into the opera house. Um, so, and I've seen some really amazing ones as well. Um, like we saw, uh, oh Jesus, uh, what's that called in English? Der Widerspenstigen Zähmung in by Shakespeare is uh, uh jesus christ man i don't even know but like anyways there were some really amazing operas that i saw um and some not so good ones i guess yeah i i wouldn't say i'm into opera though like i, I if my mom makes me go i'll go with her but um apart from that i probably wouldn't go on my own i don't think can you recommend any good books slash resources on arranging and instrumentation please says martin king i can't unfortunately there was there's a German one uh, I think it's just called Arranging by Bernhard Hoffmann which I thought was pretty good uh, was very good actually like he's very thorough and I worked with Bernhard and he's a really good guy uh, I didn't work for him he was uh, the head of uh, the school in Freiburg where I, where I studied for a while um, that one I don't there's not a lot of stuff on arrangement and instrumentation unfortunately. It's not, not a lot on that. There's a lot on like classical instrumentation. So the orchestration books that I just mentioned might be interesting for you as well if you're int intending to write for classical instruments. Then that might be interesting. 
but for pop music, not so much. I think the best way to really do it is since it's so easy to get your hands on a guitar and guitars are like a hundred bucks now, if you want to buy one for yourself, even if it's a cheap one, that's fine. Just figuring out how it works. That's totally fine. Or just borrow a guitar from someone, watch guitarists play, you know, and just to kind of figure out how it works. That's how I did it. At least I didn't learn from books. I really just listened to music and just heard what they were doing. And now I can't play drums myself a little bit, not not well though. Um, but I know exactly how a drummer does what they do. You know, I know how it works in terms of like the coordination. I know what a groove looks like. I know where the bass drum has to hit and what the what a drummer listens to when he's playing. I know what he how he tells a story through his drum playing, which is something I also talk about in the addiction formula. Um, so all that stuff. But I just learned that from from listening and from when I had the chance in the rehearsal room, just sitting behind a drum set and just kind of figuring out how that works with the right hand has to go through and then the left hand. And so you slowly kind of get that idea of how that how that works, right? Um, it was just a lot of learning by doing and watching other people play and that kind of thing. And also asking a lot of questions. I always ask every musician that I've been around in my life, I've probably asked at least one question, uh, especially like string players I've been really obsessed with for a long time with them. Um, there's so many techniques on strings. It's such a difficult instrument to write for. So yeah, that was an instrument that I, that took me a long time to sort of figure out a little bit. And I'm still nowhere near um, a good string player, string writer. Arik Devine says, can you go live more often? The live interaction is really awesome. If Is your mail available also? I love your professional input. You're really inspiring, man. Thank you so much. Really nice to hear. Uh, I'm going live every week, so that's enough for now. The views on these aren't really like that amazing. So I'm trying to keep it to once per week. <laughs> but a lot of people say that it's that they really like it. So I'm keeping it at once per week. I, I was briefly thinking about maybe doing it once a month. But a lot of people seem to get something out of these. So um as long as the views kind of stay on that same level as they are right now, then I'm going to keep doing these weekly. Um, also, yes, you can send me an email uh, at me at holistic songwriting.com and that's holistic dash songwriting.com. If you have a personal question uh, in terms of songwriting, I mean, like about your personal product. Um, sure. Superman13 says, should I feel bad for wanting to get into this pop music machine that so many people seem to hate for ruining music? Has it always existed, but only recently the public have known? Ah, that's a really good question. I mean, I just remember recently watching uh, uh, this comedian. Um, man, what's his, what's his face? Bill, Bill Hicks, one of my favorite comedians, actually. This really dark, kind of nihilistic um, comedian talking about, and this was back in the 80s talking about uh, new kids on the block and it was it sounded very much like people are talking about these really big pop artists today actually um i think here's what i think i think and the, the best time for music in terms of creativity was 60s sure with the beatles then we had the 70s when synthesizers came out and like people got really wild with experimentation maybe the songwriting got a little bit less good often but the sound design got a lot better then the 80s were kind of that was already the time when that Bill Hicks was talking about where a lot of it was like kind of streamlined and there was like a sound, a way that pop music had to sound. 90s were even worse in terms of creativity, I'm only saying, right? Not, that's not a personal thing right now. And I like a lot of music from that, those eras. But in terms of the creativity, like there was a certain formula back then to like that you had to follow kind of to be successful. 2000s also, early 2000s for sure, was kind of like a formulaic thing. And now I think uh, a lot of people are really... Uh, skeptical about that and are really like um, negative about how where pop music is at the moment. I think pop music is at a really good place right now in terms of uh, creativity. I think there's a lot of good things happening. A lot of people are, since the internet has really become our number one source of new things, um, anyone can really reach you if they do it well. If someone is smart enough to sort of you know, get in front of you and do deliver something good. They just have to deliver something good and they they can be a star. And now we see things like, um, you know, Pillow Talk by Lil Dicky, I think is such an interesting, weird track that I, when I listened to it the first time, I was like, wow, this is new. This is different. Why haven't I never heard anything like this before? This is so cool Why how people are doing this kind of thing. Uh, Bo Burnham, I think, is doing some really interesting work uh, as he's a comedian who does, who plays a lot of instruments as well, and he sings some songs on stage. But they're really funny and really smart, and they sort of 
break with the structure and they're really interesting really commercial but at the same time very creative and really interesting what he's doing there um so i think we're, right now we're in a time where really creativity is all that counts and uh i just i just really understood that when i was talking to a producer here in germany one of the biggest producers here in germany and he was struggling just as much with this new era as anyone that i talked to through skype sessions and stuff like that we're all just kind of struggling with the same things right it's right now with the socialization of the internet right everyone can be online everyone can be noticed if they do a good job it's gotten really hard to just like shove money down people's throats and make them listen to something well i you know i don't have to listen to the backstreet boys because i can just go on spotify and listen to a thousand other artists that sound more like what i want to listen to and that's what's really been happening right um so that's getting more and more interesting and so at this time and day uh, at this time i think creativity has become much more important again and it is going to become more important over the next couple of years also so if you are smart and creative and you do something new that no one else has done before or you at least give it a spin that no one else has done before i think you stand a really good shot in this business once you understand that i think it sets the ground it sets the foundation for a really good um strong music career Cool. Uh, Termalex says, currently reading The Addiction Formula, very informative slash eye-opening. I like how it covers topics I would never learn as a music engineering student. Cool. Great. Um, now we're in our in. Th by the way, thank you so much, Termalex. I really appreciate it. We're in our in. This marks the end of this live Q&A, and hopefully you all enjoyed it. Got something out of it. I saw some people uh, commented that they want this at least once a week. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see what you guys wrote about the songwriting competition, so a songwriting contest, uh, which I asked about real quick. I'm going to see if I can find that in the chat. Um, but if you have any good ideas on that, please send an email to me at me at holistic-songwriting.com, and I will be sure to check that out. And um, if that seems like a good idea to me, then uh, we might actually do that. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Cheers.